in, in a way, it's really uh, incredibly exciting to, to get this award because I think it uh, proclaims a shift away from, uh, let's say, more technical concerns possibly to a much more social question um, in the architecture uh, that we're doing. And this is uh, something that in, in a way is a big um, driver for me or motivation in the work we do uh, because really the question not only uh, what do we create as uh, material substance and as technological innovation, uh, but really what is the quality that we create for the people that inhabit those spaces and that live there um, is and remains uh, really a key concern. And this project, uh, I think, is, uh, was really born out of an explicit interest in asking the question, how could we live in a slightly uh, different way in a context that is fairly dominated uh, by standard answers. Now, this, this building may in fact be the, the lowest building that has ever uh, gotten an award, uh, maybe by the Tall Building Council. Um, may, maybe that uh, will only be the beginning, uh, but I uh, think indeed the question uh, that, that this project asks uh, is what I want to discuss today. The project is located in Singapore. Um, some of you may know it's a, a very beautiful uh, small city-state. Um, that uh, can pride itself with incredible achievements in terms of its planning. Um, it was um, awarded many times as the most livable city uh, in Asia. Um, and if we look at the city, um, it's indeed a beautiful city, but it also, for me, raises one uh, very pertinent question. If we look at this, it's a city full of tall buildings. And in a way, all these tall buildings are either better tall buildings or worse tall buildings, but they seem to give uh, in a way, very little answer beyond um, them, those pieces as singular objects. The question is, what is the space between these objects? What is the city? What is the public and urban space that we inhabit? If you would take the green away, um, you would very quickly sense that there's a bit of a problem because there is, in a way, very little sense of space. Um, luckily, the tropical nature glues everything together. Uh, but I think to think beyond buildings as individual answers um, to a, a programmatic uh, question of providing uh, inhabitable space, but really to think of a building as a generator of space for a sense of community and communal living was what interested me. The site uh, itself is along a big green belt in Singapore. It's not right in the center, but in a way it's embedded in a very natural environment. Um, the uh, project uh, asked for over 1,000 apartment units. Uh, it's about 1.8 million square feet of uh, habitable area. Um, and the typical answer would have looked like something like this, in a way. We have a 24-story height limit, so it would have been about 12 towers of 24 floors. And you can sense very quickly that the quality of life in such an arrangement may be uh, uh, highly questionable. The towers would be very close to each other, there's very little sense of privacy, but also the space on the ground that is left becomes more or less a residual that in a highly urbanized context may have a right to exist, but in a natural uh, context, I think uh, not necessarily so. Um, at the time that I started the project um, uh, in 2007, uh, we actually found this postcard. It was from 1907, exactly 100 years earlier. This is what Singapore looked like back then. It was a fishing village. And I thought the quality that is somehow visible in this image, namely um, a, a sense of community, uh, is really something that our cities have largely lost. And I wanted to ask how could we um, sort of regenerate that at um, the scales of things that we are producing today, at the densities that our cities have to accommodate. Um, the problem, obviously, with this old model is that it is not only low density, but also, in a way, low privacy. All these little buildings have no view to the outside and are very densely clustered. But once these um, uh, villages become more topographical, more vertical, you immediately sense that this kind of granular sense of community remains however things open up. So the idea for this project was, if you like, to topple the tower, to throw the vertical over into the horizontal and to stack a series um, of building blocks on top of each other with a fairly dramatic topography in themselves, uh, views to the outside and the surrounding landscape, but also inside the development. If you look from the top, you sense that or you realize it is not a random system. In fact, it's a 
a very rigorous grid uh, of a hexagonal shape that uh, forms these um, very large courtyards that in themselves become spaces of inhabitation and in a way the main uh, uh, point of defining the project. So instead of having residual space uh, in between the towers, we created these uh, incredible gardens in the center um, of, of each community courtyard uh, that were then programmed in, in various different ways uh, for, uh, to, to also provide identity to each one of these uh, natural environments. So for the children, a more adventurous playground type, uh, a lot of uh, bathing and, and pool areas since we're in the tropics uh, of Asia, uh, uh, barbecue areas uh, on, on the fringe, um, biotope, uh, uh, little um, uh, really nature uh, installations and reserves, um, of course many sports facilities down to the uh, fire truck route that we obviously need to provide for safety of the buildings, but I turned this into a one kilometer long running track, so everything in a way we needed became an available feature uh, for the inhabitants. The system was very simple. We defined uh, almost a, a typical standard uh, housing block, 70 meters long, six stories tall, uh, and then stacked them in this uh, hexagonal grid. And by doing that, I was able to basically double the distance between two um, uh, opposing buildings, where before the towers would have been nearly 30 meters close. Here we are almost 60 meters now away from each other. And as you stack the various layers, you see that the transparencies across uh, are enormous. And in section, you can sense uh, the openness and airiness, in a way, of this uh, uh, arrangement that really suddenly allows each apartment to have a vastly increased quality of views um, through uh, uh, the complex. Structurally, in a way, it's quite simple. Obviously, only where the blocks overlap you could put uh, vertical support. So these mini hexagons become, uh, in a way, mega columns that support uh, the entire structure. And within those, we're also uh, accommodating the um, elevator course and the vertical transport. So what we had to do, basically, was to define a core that would exist in a three-way rotation, each time 120 degrees, um, within a standard block. Um, all these cores are naturally ventilated, uh, uh, filled with natural daylight. Um, and we then optimized the cores according to the height, uh, number of floors they served um, to be um, at the uh, maximum uh, end of efficiencies. So um, number of elevators and staircases, again, responding precisely um, to the height they serve. Um, the unit mix um, an, an enormous amount of uh, uh, different typologies for the various uh, inhabitants and the various tastes. And you can see that despite the complexity of the overall building shape, obviously um, the, the unit layouts are incredibly um, rigorous and functional and uh, useful. Um, we, we spend a lot of time on uh, passive design intelligence for the environment, studied the sun paths, daylighting for all the apartments, optimized the facades according to orientation, but could also prove that the building itself would provide sufficient shading in those courtyards so that the tropical sun uh, would not make those spaces unlivable. We placed water bodies along the uh, dominant uh, uh, directions of winds so that evaporative cooling would further provide microclimates in these courtyards uh, that would be pleasant to occupy for the inhabitants. And in a way, this layering of spaces from the more communal to the more and more private, but the variety of spaces that the project provides, I think, is one of the key features that really brings us back to the beginning of a space that is for living and for the uh, people that inhabit it. Um, on the purely um, uh, amount of, of space available, um, by greening the entire ground plus all the roof terraces of these stacked blocks, we actually provide 112% of green space and of gardens of the site. So actually we have more green than not having built any building. And I want to end with a series of impressions. This was the uh, structure under construction um, and this is it uh, now in its completed state. And I think um, an, a helicopter shot that really shows how close uh, the design is uh, or the execution is to the initial design. And you can sense with this picture maybe best um, the, the enormous complexity uh, that is there, the richness and diversity in spaces wherever you live, you can find your, roof, your favorite roof gardens with a view to the city or a view into the jungle. 
um, you can occupy these courtyards and you see how these blocks fl float in a very airy and open way, permeable by the winds but also by the views um, across this uh, uh, tropical landscape. This is the 13th floor, so you sense that we've really established new datums um, of inhabitation and occupation for the people that live there. Um, these are sunken spa gardens. Here you see um, the, the, uh, and, and the lower deck of parking completely naturally ventilated and interconnected with the entire development. And I think really the, the most fascinating thing as you are there is not only the interconnectedness and openness of these spaces, but really the richness and diversity and multiplicity of spaces available for the people that live there um, to enjoy uh, a very different sense of living than in the typical towers. And as we worked with the developers, I want to end on the three themes that we defined. Instead of always talk about projects as iconic or about lifestyle, all these very fashionable words that are being used, we said maybe we should focus on something far more pragmatic and simple. It's a project that is about nature, um, it is about community, and it is about space. And with this, we created, um, together with uh, 2 by 4 a, a logo for the project, and I want to hand over to the client um, who will show you the project from their perspective. Thank you. Now, for Capital Land, we have Chile, oh, okay, I don't know what happened to the logos, but basically we have a little tagline that says um, building people and building community. That's what that little funny line is supposed to say. And these three um, teams that um, for the project actually set very well with us. And that was actually what we used throughout the entire project of how we actually go in, um, even up to the marketing and construction phase of the project itself. Now, the site itself is only eight hectares. Now, it may not seem very big, but in Singapore's context, it's actually a very precious piece of land. Uh, to put it in context, Singapore is about 277 square, um, square miles in, in area. Uh, the land itself is only about 28 miles across. And the site is uh, quite prestigious. It's actually uh, quite just off the central business district. So it's, uh, in Singapore, eight hectare lands for residential is very rare. In fact, in the past 20 years, it's probably the, the first one they were developing. So we wanted to make sure that it was very well developed and, uh, and to do what we wanted to do achieve. And that's where, uh, that's where we came together with this. Um, a bit of history on this pro the land itself. Uh, originally, it was called the Railway Hill. It was the British barracks in the 1958s. And uh, in 1984, the Gilman Heights, which was our previous condominium, was built. Uh, that consisted of basically four towers of 20 storeys and some uh, walk-up apartments. And as you can see, the ground itself is actually all just a surface car park with a bit of green in the centre and on the perimeter. So after almost two years of um, designing, uh, it was about time to realise the, the design itself. Um, after moving, people are giving them time to uh, move out. We started demolition in late 2009, uh, which took about six months. And then the actual construction started in March 2010 and completed in September 2013. Now, originally, the construction period was planned for 45 months, but we were actually able to complete it uh, way ahead of schedule in only 42.5 months. Okay, these are the first initial shots of the construction works where they're pouring a cement for the foundation works. Um, cement use, sorry, concrete use was actually 176,000 cubic meters. Now, that's about enough to fill up about 70 Olympic sized swimming pool. Okay. Um, this is an aerial view of the works in progress on site. As you can see, um, these are some of the details that we also try to incorporate with the contractor, like you know, these little hexagonal patterns on the underside, which was actually uh, put in to replicate the design exactly was originally intended. Okay, another view from above. Um, 24,000 tonnes of reinforcement steel was used. Uh, this is about um, the weight of 80 numbers of A380 uh, jetliners. Now, one of the interesting challenges was actually this particular block, which was um, actually suspended more than 60 meters above the ground. And uh, they actually explored different ways to do it, but ultimately it was using basic um, scaffolding, structural scaffolding to create the uh, structural form work, where they can actually then cast the work just like the other blocks itself. The construction took a total of uh, 14 million man hours. Now, to put that in perspective, that's about uh, one man working for more than 1,400 years just to build this. 
And we were very proud that we were able to do this uh, accident-free totally throughout the entire project. Okay. This was a perspective that uh, Ola uh, gave us at the end of, uh, to about end of 2009, just before the launch of the project. And this was what uh, we've completed at the end of 2013. Um, everything is almost uh, exactly what the line shape. Uh, the only thing is waiting is actually the plants on the surface, on, on sorry, on the balconies themselves. Now, uh, these three themes also we try and carry through throughout the entire project: uh, commitment to nature. So we actually retain over 40 existing trees during the demolition of the site. Everything we try and keep as many trees as we can, but mostly around the perimeters. Uh, we planted 140 species of, of uh, plants, uh, over 1,500 trees and palms. And some of it are very integral to the project, like you know, this creating this, this actually drop off where we actually have to lift in a tree through the opening. So all this was actually integral in the design and was actually incorporated um, by and part of the construction works. And some of the trees we found that we actually needed to, as we go into the construction, we found that we need to buy bigger trees, uh, much bigger than the, the, the normal ones. Um, these are the usual ones, but we got them about two and a half times bigger than the usual, so that we can actually plant them from the basement itself. Um, as Ola explained earlier, the, a large part of the cars actually are in the basement so that the surface is actually quite traffic free. So we wanted to make sure that the basement itself was um, part of the greenery also so that when you look, when you're in the basement, you're standing up, you look up, you see nothing but trees. Um, this is a view of the basement where actually the trees have actually grown up very well. I think this one is a gift of the tropics. Again, this is a, a little jungle again growing up from the basement and this is the E, the e level above itself. Um, on the E deck itself, um, next to the swimming pool, a uh, myriad of uh, various type of planting. And this is uh, just less than one year after completion, the type of uh, greens that we are having right now. And as you can see here from, from the first um, shot of the construction was that you can see from the balcony, and some, some of the residents really started to put in the greening at the balconies themselves and even on the rooftops. So this was what actually we hoped for and uh, it's very starting to take, take food. This is, uh, we also have uh, nine sky gardens as part of the interesting design of this project. And we actually created nine themes for them, uh, very quiet, small gathering spaces for people to come together and um, just part of the community building exercise for the whole project. Uh, this is a chess garden, and you can see up here, this is the uh, hexagonal pattern that you saw in, during the construction, which we replicated um, faithfully. Now, commitment to nature is also not just uh, as a developer's part. What we actually built it, we actually foresee that the residents have to be co-creator of this greenery. Uh, we have actually 99 roof terraces and 68 ground gardens, which are PS, uh, private enclosed spaces. And on top of that, we also have um, many balconies, which with the uh, planters at the edge of it. So to start people off, we actually gave uh, each owner um, pots of plants, as many as they can use to fill up the planters so that it will actually kick them off the, uh, on this uh, greening of their, their whole interlaced development itself. And some of them even got their own plants, you can see from here, with uh, creating a very lush planting. And this really actually allows the plants actually to hang over subsequently. Here is the private enclosed space, where this is the planting by the owners, and this is the, the planting in, of the development itself. So you can see actually there's a graying of the, the green, so, and this is a walk path in the center. And all this has actually been recognized by the local uh, NPARCs uh, and also the Singapore Landscape Architect Awards when we received uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, recognition for them. And not forgetting also their rec experience of space. Now, um, the design has already created this main access to development so that uh, makes orientation easier, um, recognition of the spaces. But we wanted to go one step ahead. We actually added um, subsequently, because we wanted always to see, like, when people go through this development, what do they feel, what do they see? So we actually created, uh, we had added uh, sculptures along this development. Um, all this by renowned sculptors. This is a local one by Kumari, um, by Kao Xiaowu, uh, City Dreams from China. Um, this is a uh, good fun by Chong Fa Chong, who's uh, actually a Singapore um, sculptor, but it's actually based in Canada now and then the Marinetti pandas. So this, uh, this actually gives people a, a way of orientating the way. It's like, it's not just going there and say, like, oh, let's look for block 197, for example. You can say, hey, let's meet at the red chili, you know, or let's, you go up to the red pandas and you just turn right. So it makes 
navigation of the spaces a lot more friendly. And of course, not forgetting the rooms itself. Um, we make the rooms itself all very regular, very square, um, with big openings that actually opens out into the balconies themselves. Okay, the bedrooms with also big windows that you can actually step out onto the balconies for certain units. And then options of open kitchen. And those without balconies, we actually have got bay windows with big windows again, bringing lots of lights. Um, and of course, not forgetting a focus on community. Okay, it's not just about creating gym, gymnasiums, but it's also like creating the spaces together so that um, multi-generations can come together. Um, so, like, so like this open space actually is very good for children and parents because they can go around and they actually have, uh, can be very confident of going around having exercises, um, creating actually outdoor uh, gym sessions. And also even like choosing of equipment, right? It's also like trying to choose equipment where, you know, it actually serves multi-purpose, like for example, uh, make sure it's wheelchair friendly and then for big family gatherings. And also actually garnered us the Platinum Award from the building, uh, local building control authorities. And this is only the second project in Singapore that has garnered this Platinum Award. And of course, we we'll actually progressively create activities for um, residents um, like this, the Lion Dance Chinese New Year, um, Easter Party, and then more recently, the, the Mooncake Festival. And then we're actually all the spaces you can see actually put to very good use. Of, that's what we foresee them to be used for, gatherings and spaces. And some of the use. So at the end of the day, it's also not just a building, but um, creating these spaces that people would be um, would find very at home with. And I think nothing sums it up better than uh, this final shot by actually one of the residents themselves, uh, which shows uh, um, the parent and, a, and, a, and the daughter in, the, in their home at the end of the day. Thank you.